Good morning and welcome to our service. We hope you enjoy the worship, uh, the thought that will be shared, and most importantly, the word. May you be blessed in Jesus' name. alone faultless stand before the throne Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the same
there's um as we were singing this morning, I was just thinking about, you know, we were, we were worshiping God there, but how perfect God is. And that other song we sung about is Reckless Love, how he comes after us. And it started me thinking, in my spirit, thinking about what God does for us and how he has chased us down. You know, and I, and I came to a very famous verse was brought to my mind this morning in John chapter 3, which you all know. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but of everlasting life. Isn't that amazing that God would love us so much that he would give his only begotten son so none of us should perish? I mean, it's a verse we've heard many, many times. We all think about it, but actually when we were singing that, that song this morning about the reckless love of God, how he came after us, how he, he poured himself out for us at Calvary. we just come through the Easter prayer last week and we realized that that you know, that God gave himself totally for us. He held nothing back. You know, he kicked down the walls of separation. He broke open the chains of death. He smashed the gates of sin that barricaded us in. He tore them down. Now he poured out everything to do that for us. There's nothing that God wouldn't do for us. Nothing that God wouldn't do for you. Thank you, Lord. When when you start to think about that, it's pretty awesome, isn't it? You know, there's a scripture that says, you know, that we should lay, lay, that he laid down his life for us. You know the scripture in Romans? He laid down his life for us. In other words, some of us might, you know, might step in. For somebody else, you know, I often admire these, you know, these bodyguards. You know, we we just had a U.S. president. You know, the, the, these these guys with the dark glasses on, the thing in their ear, running around. You, you know the person I'm talking about. Those guys are supposed to step in in front of a bullet for the person they're protecting. Whoever the president is, whether it's Biden or Trump or whoever it was, they're, 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 no matter who who the president, their job is to step in front of that bullet for him. Who wants that job? You know, who wants, you know, it's not one people's out going, oh, I want that, you know. I want to take a bullet for somebody else. I want to, yeah, Jesus did that exactly for us. To save us from death and hell. He took the punishment that was rightfully ours. And it's just, it's just wonderful to see that, that God loves us so much that he didn't withhold anything from us and that should encourage us this morning because that means that my God my Father in heaven has only a blessing for us you know Matthew chapter 7 says if you ask anything in my name it shall be done you know knock seek find you know the, you know the text and if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children how much more will our Father in heaven give good gifts to us God's got good things for you this morning in the midst of the difficulties in the midst of the problems because God gives us peace when nobody else can one of the things that I've had the joy to see over the years as a pastor and uh, is seeing people in desperate situations have a peace that was more peaceful than mine why? because the king of kings was there if we be evil, we to give good gifts. How much more does a Father in heaven not give to us this morning? Isn't he wonderful this morning? Isn't he glorious? We need to just thank him this morning. Father, we just thank you for being so good to us. We thank you for being so kind to us. We thank you, Lord, that you did not withhold anything, Lord, at Calvary for us. That indeed, Lord, your love is still reaching into our lives. And Lord, for those this morning and those maybe listening on who are disturbed by things, Lord, I thank you that you can give them a peace, Lord, that passes understanding. Lord, the circumstances sometimes can be difficult, but your peace supersedes that. So Holy Spirit, just come right now in the name of Jesus and touch each and every one in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Isn't it wonderful when the Holy Spirit moves? And without any human choreography or whatever the word is, <laughs> brings things together and you know he's wanting to say something. And just from uh, Miriam and the interpretation that was given and David's uh, sharing the thought and Martin at the table, I could just see strands of what I feel the Lord is wanting to say to us this morning. Um, again, it's lovely to be back with you. It's lovely to see everybody. Uh, right, you're all looking very well. So you sorry, you've always had a nice Easter. Uh, hopefully had a good break and good time of remembering what what this is all about, what church, what are our lives in Christ are, are all about. And we thank God for the resurrection. There was no greater event in human history than the resurrection of Jesus Christ because that has paved the way for us to have life and be with him eternally. So I'm just going to move that way. I'm scared of tripping over this here, you see. Just was looking at that going, that's a, that's a trap for me there. I'm, <laughs> you see my legs coming up in the air. <laughs> yes, 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 I know. <laughs> so I've been studying a, a portion of scripture. We're going to look at, I'm not going to read it all out because it's very long, but I'm going to read out choice portions of it. If you could turn with me just before we pray to John chapter 11, and it's the story of Lazarus that I'm sure you all know very well. Um, I'm going to just pray and then I'm going to read out uh, just the beginning of this and then I'll read out some just different verses as we go through. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge portion of scripture. Whenever I delved into this, it just exploded in life. And so many, when you're a preacher, you see we things that, oh, I could preach that and we rabbit trails you could. I just was actually nearly overwhelmed. There's so much. This, this book is alive. It's God's, God's word. It is a, there's life here. There's life here for us this morning. And I was excited as I, I looked into some of the huge concepts and thoughts and meanings that are here. It's wonderful. Get, get into this word. This is, this is life to you. And it says, uh, <clears throat> just go, I'll read this out and then we'll pray. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary. And, his sister, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now laid sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Let's just pray. Lord, we just pray this morning that your word would penetrate our hearts. Lord, we need you. We need to know uh, the reality of the resurrection in our lives. Lord, for our own sake, but also for the sake of a dying world, for our families, our friends, the people that we love, and those out there we come across, Lord, we pray that something of the power of the resurrection will really permeate us today afresh. Lord, we know and we've heard and we're reminded of things, but Lord, we pray by the power and anointing of your Holy Spirit that you will open our eyes afresh, that we may behold wonderful things in your word. And we commit this time into your hands. Help me, Lord. Help me say only what you want me to say. And Lord, help me just to convey to you something of your wonderful and great heart for us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, this is a wonderful, a wonderful gospel. I love John's gospel. And do you know that John had a very, very definite purpose in writing this gospel that was placed into his heart by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit inspired him and moved him. And you see it at the end uh, of John's gospel. It says, John says, these things have been written so that you might believe. There's a very definite, there's, there's very specific miracles 
And there's very specific theological statements when Jesus said, says, I am, I am the resurrection life, I am the bread of life, etc. So these, these miracles are coupled with this, these great theological statements that came forth in, the, in the, the message that was given in tongues, that God is the great I am. Now, we've got several characters in this book. We have Martha, we have Mary, we have Lazarus, and we have Jesus. And we have all the crowds and the disciples around. Four main characters here. And we're going to go to part one, which is Martha. Now, Martha is a very interesting lady, so she is, and uh, we know from other portions of Scripture something about Martha's character, and Jesus loved them, and these were people who were very intricately involved in the ministry of Jesus Christ when he was here on earth, um, and it's very interesting. Verses 20 to 27, we're going to read out, and this is Martha. Uh, Verse 20 says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, because he was coming in the Judah uh, to them, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at that last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God who is coming to the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. So there we have dear old Martha. And Martha was very bold, I think, because it's interesting here that it's Martha who goes to Jesus while Mary stays at home. We read in Luke chapter 10, it talks about Martha encumbered in the kitchen and Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. So different here. The first person to go to Jesus is Martha. See, Martha was a very practical person, very pragmatic. She was very, you know, and you need people like that around. You definitely, you know, things don't function. I was uh, with a, a deacon from Port Stewart Baptist having coffee with him on uh, Friday afternoon. And we were chatting about things that would probably bore people to tears about church governance and practical things and, and all that there. And he says, I love it. I love all these things. And I went, praise the Lord that you do, because I don't love all those practical things. But that's how God's gifted this man. But Martha was a very practical person. And she comes to Jesus. And I've always thought, and you might disagree, but I've always thought that her relationship with Jesus was very mechanical. It was very sort of clunky and very, you know, it was just you know, things and doing things and practical things. And that sort of comes out here a wee bit because she relates to the Lord in quite a strange and probably a very bold way. So she does. Um, but here, the Lord still loves her. And he loves us all with all our foibles and all our individuality and all our differences. Um, and he relates to us where, at the point that we come to him. Um, but she sort of blames it on, on the Lord. If you had been here, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. Have you ever said that to the Lord? Lord, if you'd only stepped in, if you'd only done this, if you had only been here, this wouldn't have happened. I know I've done it many, many times to my shame. But God can handle it because he walks with us through or maturing process. So she had had been faith. If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. This terrible event of my brother dying would not have happened. So God, you missed it. You missed it. You weren't on time. You know, you, you, you stayed away for a few extra days. You could have been here. It could have been sorted out. But Jesus knows what he's doing. Amen. So he does. She seemed to have a very small view of God, a very restricted view. God, he needed to be there. God needs to be exactly there for this to happen. If his physical presence isn't here, then it's, 
Everything is lost. It's all over. And the Psalms talk about one of God's grievances with his people in the wilderness. It says in Psalm 78, but they limited the Holy One of Israel. We can limit God. I want to tell you this morning that your God is very big. That your God can stretch back into the past. He can stretch back into the past in your mind and things that you look back on with pain and hurt and sorrow. I can tell you this, that his power can change even the way you perceive. Joseph said this here. He named one of his sons, that was it Ephraim or Manasseh? The Lord has made me forget the pain in my land of my suffering. God is able to do that this morning because he is the resurrection and the life. She professed a faith which seems to be very pious and real in verses 22 and 24. Oh, I know, Lord, she says twice. I know God will answer. I know he will rise on the last day. She not only had had been faith, but she had what would be called will be faith. It'll happen yes away then. I know it'll happen then. You should have been here to do it, but I know it can happen then. But here Jesus is standing there right now. And this morning Jesus is standing here as well. He's standing right in front of you and in the spirit in his presence. He's before every one of your, each one of your faces. And he says to you, I'm here. I'm here for you this morning. He's in our midst today. But Jesus declares to her one of the most powerful declarations that have, has ever been spoken. And he says this, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection And the life, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asked her, do you believe this? She was given a wee bit of a schooling here. And the way she related to God is very interesting because she came with a whole lot of preconceived ideas about God. A whole lot of preconceived, if you'd been here, I know you can do that. I believe you are. A lot of it sounds as if it's coming from the mind rather than the heart. And she's got this very interesting, and a lot of religion today, I think, is is what it is. Religion, religious activities. God is looking for people who will come to them with an open heart. He doesn't need our religious services. He doesn't need our liturgies or things that look and sound religious. He sees our heart. And he wants your heart today. He wants you to relate to him on a heart level. Because he knows everything about you. And he loves you. Even before you were walking with him, he loved you. And he cared for you. And he pursued you. And he went for you. And he does this for Lazarus. He goes to this tomb. And it's interesting and telling that uh, Martha says, the teacher is here. So she seemed to have a very academic view and she's relating on to Jesus on this sort of level. She's been very practical in Luke's gospel here. It's very academic. And she's sort of missing the point of who Jesus is. He's the son of God. He is God incarnate walking in her midst and she's relating to him in this strange way. But it's all that she knows and, and the Lord loves her and he works with her. And he brings her into an amazing truth. And we see this, that there's different people who relate to God in different ways. And God meets with them. Exactly. You and I, exactly where we're at. But there's something that I saw in the relationship that Mary had with Jesus that really challenged me and grasped me. And I went, wow, this is, this is so different. Jesus was saying to her, this is who I am, to Martha. I am the resurrection life. This wasn't just a statement to write down in a notepad. The resurrection in life is standing right in front of you. He is here. Psalm 46 says, God is in the midst of her. An ever-present help in time of trouble. Because, and we heard it this morning, that veil has been torn in two from the top to the bottom. It means that we can now walk freely by the blood of Jesus, no other way, into his presence to ask him for his help 
in our time of need. Even if something happened yesterday in your life, I've experienced this recently. I'll maybe share it in a testimony sometime. I've experienced something that I've never experienced before of how God can reach back in your heart and in your mind and he can bring the balm of Gilead to a hurt and a pain that has maybe troubled you and hurt you and been throbbing for years and years and he can heal it even to the point where you look back on it and smile. Only the Lord can do that. Only the power of God can do that. Now Mary now comes to Jesus and I'm going to read out just the portion where Mary comes here. When Mary, in verse 29, it says, When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. We see Mary came to Jesus and she asked the same thing, if you'd been here. And then she wept. And I was just thinking about this in the light of children because we're God's children. I was just thinking about how we approach him because he is our father. And I know that as a child, uh, I've seen not only my nephews and nieces, but I've seen how different children, I know you all have as well, how they approach. And sometimes... I would go to my mum and I was very clinical and I was very uh, matter of fact and, and my mum obviously met me at the point of my need and related to me and I remember, uh, and that was wonderful, but I remember my sister and my dad would come in and she would just, she, she wouldn't come with this, dad I need you to do this and this. She would just run and go, yeah! And my dad would just grab her. And I was just thinking about how God is a father and we can have a concept sometimes that God is this austere being in the ether and he's unapproachable and you bring your requests and then you step it back again very quickly. I do not believe our God is like that. No. I believe he is a father who deeply loves each one of us. Amen. And Yes, we can approach him with all our theological suppositions and our great, oh Lord, almighty in heaven. Nothing wrong with that. I pray like that sometimes. I enjoy praying like that sometimes. I love giving God, because it's, for me it's reverence. But there's times I believe God just wants us to come to him and say, Daddy, Father, help. Help. And this is what I believe Martha did. And I believe it's, I think it's interesting in how Jesus reacted to how uh, Mary, sorry, approached him. Martha had approached with this sort of blame game. God, it's your fault if you'd been here and all these different things. And Mary came a very different way. She came and she broke down. She said the thing, if you'd been here, but then she broke down and she wept. And you know something? There's something I believe about our distress that moves the heart of God. You see it the whole way through the scripture. I'm going to read out a couple of verses. You see, in these days, the gods of the pagan cultures like the Greeks and the Romans, uh, they were described and known to be, it was called apatheia. It's where we get the word apathy. Uh, which means unfeeling, uncaring, unmoved, unemotional, no ability to feel emotion, pain, or to care in a deep way. Well, I want to say this morning that our God is not like that. Our God cares deeply for us this morning. I'm going to read out some 
beautiful scriptures uh, that we see this. We see this through the whole of the of the the Old Testament. And sometimes I struggle because I don't know if you've ever heard some people think the God of the Old Testament is different to the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament doesn't carry the God of judgment and wrath, but the God of God, that, that's a that's a theology that's out there. And I have never seen that. I have seen a God that is moved by the feeling of his people's infirmities. I've seen a God that when he looked down uh, to the, the children of Israel who were languishing in the land of Egypt, I've seen a God that when the Lord says in Exodus 3 verse 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am coming down to deliver them. That's not an uncaring, unloving, unmoved, distant God. That's a God who wants to be with you in your present reality. He wants to be with you in your present distress. No matter what you're going through, God cares this morning and he is the resurrection and the life he not only cares he doesn't just have the ability to 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 turn his head to the side and go ah oh, he has the ability to do something about it because he is the resurrection and the life it says in psalm 18 it's a lovely psalm um king david David went through the mill in his life. It says, the pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him, even to his ears. And the word of God tells us it tells us in Psalm 18 that he was angry. He was angry at what was happening to his child. And he came down and delivered him from, his, from David's enemy who was too strong for him. That's the God we serve. We still serve him. He came along to the tomb of Lazarus. He came and heard and listened. He didn't rebuke. He could have rebuked Martha and said, now Martha, you need to be a bit more respectful here. He listened. Do you know why? God has big shoulders. There's nothing that surprises God. Amen. Nothing that will hurt God except his people not trusting in him and turning from him. That's what breaks the heart of God. But God can handle it when we come to him with our pain and our woes and our difficulties and we say, God, I need you to help me. And God says, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. And he says that to you this morning, that he's here for you. He cares about you. He loves you. And he wants to intervene in your situation. And I want to encourage you to be like Mary. Mary went, she didn't come with a, 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 a list and a blame game. She came and she dropped at his feet and wept. And it says that he was deeply moved in his spirit. And he wept. He identified with her pain and with the difficulty that he was going through. Psalm, or Isaiah chapter 63 is a beautiful verse. And it says this. It talks about the children of Israel going through the, the difficulties and the pains and the woes in their history. And it says this. In all their suffering, he also suffered. He suffered at seeing his people in distress. And then it says, and he personally rescued them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them through all the years. He carried them. He carried them. Do you know the shepherd? I've been in a situation recently where uh, I've seen a lot of God's flock, God's people, uh, in a way being driven in church, being driven. Now, the heart's right. It's a, it's a zeal and a fervency. And there was one girl who came and we were sitting all sitting to have coffee and she was broken. She was under the pressure. And I was trying to say, look, just take a break. I was trying to be practical. I wasn't trying to be, you know, against it. I, look, just take a wee break. You know, that's all you need. Rest. The shepherd leads you to still waters. He makes you down to lie. He, he leads you beside green pastures. Whenever you get into a place where you're hot and bothered, God allows you to take a break. He's not driving you. And I showed her a picture, and it was just of a shepherd holding a sheep. And you know something, there's times that he needs to do that with you and I. Amen. 
you know, he's, he's not saying, you know, keep on, keep on, keep on. Sometimes you need to just lie down in the shepherd's arms. Because he leads his flock. He leads us in life. He doesn't drive us. He leads us. And whenever we're tired and we're weary, he's there for us. And sometimes I, I think that he loves that whenever. I love it when my wee dog, who is on her last legs, dear lover, she just gets up and she comes over. And I know all she doesn't want food. But surprisingly, that's how we know she's not well, because food was a, uh, was a main thing for her. But she just wants a wee cuddle. And sometimes I think God enjoys when we just come to him and say, God, I'm just here because I, I, I need to know your love and I need to know your presence. I believe he loves it when, when we do come to him in our distress, not because we are distressed, but because it's, we're coming to the one who can do something about it. And we're not just flapping around trying to deal with it ourselves. We're not trying to be clever or theological, but like a little child, we're coming and saying, Father, I need you to help me. And sometimes you don't need words to do that. Sometimes that's done in tears. But Jesus was deeply moved by this and he moves in power. And sometimes I wonder if this type of fervency, because it's not always just loud prayer, sometimes it's when the heart is broken and contrite. Jesus, the, the word of God says that he dwells with those whose spirit is broken and contrite. And I think about the, the portion of scripture about Elijah, where he fervently cried out to God. And he did, because fervency can come in words and it can come in, but he cried out to God. And it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. And I believe when we come to God like that, I believe that moves God. And we're going to see him move in the action here. You see, Jesus saw Mary and Martha and, and all weeping and mourning for their brother. And Jesus also, I believe, because Lazarus was such a friend, he wept for Lazarus personally. And I believe for each one of us, that care of God comes to us. That's the wonderful thing about God and his Holy Spirit. It means that he can meet with each of us wherever we're at through the power of his spirit. But you know something? One of the reasons I believe that Jesus also wept because I believe he not only saw this grave, but I saw, believe he saw the graves of men and women stretching right back to Adam and right forward to the end of time. He saw the dead in spirit, dead to God walking around. Lives were really tombs with no life of God in them. Billions. He saw the power of sin and death that he was going to that cross to ultimately defeat. And he was deeply moved, deeply distressed, not only at the plight of the situation that was before him, but for the plight of the whole world. And David read it out for God so loved the world that he gave. He came for this world because he saw what sin had done and he was willing because of his great love to lay down his life, to set aside his glory to take on the human form as a servant and give his life for us. That's how deep his love goes. Ephesians chapter two says, and this goes for all of us. We were by nature children of wrath. We weren't just going to get the judgment of God. We were going to get the wrath of God. But that wrath fell on Calvary. That wrath fell on him. And verse 4 in Ephesians 2 say, says this, But God, but God, thank God that's, that those words are there, but God intervened, God stepped in, God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. Not by your effort, not by your work, but by his sacrifice and by his grace. And now he comes to the tomb of Lazarus in order that we may believe. He performs one of the most amazing miracles. After being deeply moved, he came and he told them to take away the stone. We heard about the stone today from Martin. 
The stone, you see, there's a stone over men and women's hearts, your loved ones who are not in Christ. There's a stone, and we need to pray that that stone is moved away. I believe, I believe prayer moves that stone away. He wants to take away a stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. Jesus made a declaration, and as I'm sure you all know, and I've heard it from every preacher who's preached in this, he had to mention Lazarus' name in person, because if he hadn't, the whole world's cemeteries would have been emptied. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. The word of God goes forth. You see, if there's going to be new life, God's word needs to go forth. Places that are removing God's word are removing the very means that God uses to get into a heart because it's by faith and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. I want to ask you today, is God speaking to you today? He spoke to Lazarus. I've read scripture. I, you might have heard the words, but I want to ask you, are you hearing his voice? Because God could be saying anything to you this morning. Where you're at, he meets you where you're at. But he spoke to Lazarus, a dead man. And this dead man came back to life. He heard the call of God, calling him forth from death unto life. And all of us here who are in Christ have heard that call. We heard him call us. It wasn't, oh, just I said this prayer and I went to the church service. Unless you've heard him call you. Have you come from death to life? Yes, because that's what's needed. The voice of God. Is he calling you right now? Is he calling you for salvation? Is he calling you to the ministry? Is he calling you to the mission field? Is he calling you for, for whatever? Is he speaking to you today? Scripture says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Amen. Let him speak to you because he's got good things that he wants to bring in your life. He gives one more instruction. I'm just going to finish here. And this is a big one. And this is what I mean about this text. When I read this, it just went, and I went, whoa, there's so much in here. You can only touch in the things the Lord leads you to. This verse of scripture, Jesus speaks the word and brings him forth. No one else can do that because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Yes. But he says this to the people around, loose him and let him go. You see, Christ has given the church a commission today. He's given us a commission to not only carry forth his word and sow the seed of his word and preach the gospel, but he's also given the Ascension Ministries in particular and all the other ministries role of seeing the grave clothes removed from every single one of us. Because we came out of the grave, but sometimes we still have the old man and he's on our back like a monkey on our back. And the Bible says this here, put off the old man, put on the new man. But sometimes we need help with that. We need our brothers and our sisters to do that, it's easier said than done. Sometimes we need prayer. We need people to pray for us, to draw alongside, to, to, to lead us in the things of God. But that's a ministry for the church that is so needed today. I, I lead a wee men's group up and it was a, a blessing to be with the men here on Wednesday night. And we had a lovely openness and I believe God moved among us. And, it was, uh, and I believe that God wants to do that everywhere. And I believe that a lot of people in their lives, in their Christian walk, sit week in and week out with hurt and pain and woundedness in their lives. And I want to tell you today, I believe God wants to, to deal with that. Amen. He wants to heal hurts. Hurts that are sometimes, sadly to say, could have been inflicted in the house of God. That would never happen, sure it wouldn't. But it does Wounded in the house of our friends. But listen, there's forgiveness and there's healing in the hands of Almighty God. The task we have before us as the people of God 
is not to bring people to life. Our job is to declare the word of God and let God's word go forth and the Holy Spirit bring it into people's hearts. We can pray the stone is rolled away so the people hear, but what we need to be aware of and about our Father's business is in the church and in ministering to each other in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, just to conclude... Of all the things, there's a beautiful verse at the end of John's gospel uh, that always intrigued me uh, because whenever you think about uh, the, the apostle John is making it clear in chapter 20 that these things, these specific things have been written that you might believe, these miracles, the turning of the water into wine, the statements of, but that's not all Jesus did. And it's a lovely verse and it says this, and it's always intrigued me. Uh, <clears throat> in verse 25, the final verse of John's gospel says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Jesus did a lot more. These things are given specifically that we might believe. I want to finish today by saying no matter what situation you find yourself in today, and it could be as dire as poor old Lazarus, could be like King David when the cords of death had surrounded him. There's one who holds the keys of life and he is the resurrection and the life today. I want to encourage you, as I always believe, is a good way to finish any sermon. The answer is not with a preacher or a pastor or a worship leader or a deacon or whatever. The answer is with God. Amen. And there's nothing that your father likes more than you going into his presence and getting alone with him. The world doesn't need more government. It doesn't need more religion, more leaders. It needs the power of the resurrection to be displayed and outwork in the life of believers. Throwing through the, the lives of believers to show that there's only life to be found in one place. There's only a remedy for the ills of this world. All of the ailments to be found in one place and that is in the resurrected Christ. So I want to encourage you, go to him like Mary did. Not like Martha, poor old Martha. The Lord loved her. But I want you to go like Mary did and be real with him because he already knows. But he wants to see if we know. Yes, that's right. Let's just pray. Let's just pray. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you this morning that you're with us in the person of your Holy Spirit. Yes. And we thank you, Lord, that you ministered to us this morning, that you spoke to us, that you... Yes. You draw things together. Lord, we just ask you that the word of God would really resonate in our hearts, that you would give us a real revelation, Lord. We need our eyes to be opened and our understanding to be enlightened as we read and study and search your scriptures. May we know that we know that we know when you say that you love us and you care for us and that you want us to come to you, Lord. Father, I just pray for each one of us here that you'd bring us home safely and bless us with a deep sense of your abiding, enduring, and loving presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen.
my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name I've been born again